Hello and welcome everybody to our conversation. This will be a talk in the context of the Data Control Center project and the exhibition The Glassroom is Information Edition from Tactical Tech. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our speakers. Daria Kuziaeva. Uh, Kuziava, she's online through Zoom, and Kirill Obiskaravain is uh, here with me in the uh, exhibition uh, place in M17 in Kiev. They are curators of exhibition within the Data Control Center project and co founders of uh, the Kunst, Kunst project. Luis Hisayasu, she is a uh, an interdisciplinary researcher who represents Tactical Tech Collective here. Uh, she also will participate uh, through Zoom. As I said before, Tactical Tech made an important contribution to the project. Serhii Klimko, uh, he is also particip participate through Zoom. He's a curator of Kiev Biennale, Biennale and a participant of the Visual Culture Research Center. Uh, my name is Vitaly Atanasov. I am journalist, editor, and event organizer. I am currently working on the anthology Digital Capitalism and Internet Utopias. Now I will make uh, a short uh, introductory remarks. Network technologies, the internet, the digital device, devices uh, are becoming inevitable and ubiquitous. It's hard to imagine our life without these technologies. The pandemic has merely reinforced this trend Remote work is gaining more and more acceptance among employers. Public events went online too, and our discussion, discussion via Zoom is a common example. And uh, it's all based on digital communications, technology and infrastructures, and it became a new dimension of vulnerability. As we know, often commercial and political interests dominate these technologies and infrastructures. For users and citizens, this comes at a high price. The loss of control over our personal data, privacy, media consumption, from a broader perspective, this affects our picture of the world. So we need a crucial, critical look to our digital environment. Let's discuss how cultural initiatives and interdisciplinary projects can develop critical thinking and media literacy. Uh, now, I will invite Daria Kirillo, uh, invite to tell us about the ideas and uh, the concepts behind the Data Control Center uh, project and the exhibition at all, and then how the project deals with these issues. Thanks. I will follow the concept ladies first much. and give the word to Dasha. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> um, so I think it's quite uh, important to say. Um, Thank you for the introduction and um, and yeah, so the whole exhibition is about control over your personal data, how to regain this control and of course we, our th first thoughts uh, when we were organizing this project uh, together with our partners from Tactical Tech and Goethe Institute um, were this growing concern about how our personal data are used especially after this uh, big scandals and uh, situations like uh, Cambridge Analytica and um, the elections manipulations and so on. So, and this growing concern that the misinformation and disinformation are spreading uh, across social networks and, and how our personal data are being traded and just like used against us. And uh, also the growing concern that not really that many people are thinking about us and just uh, giving away this confidentiality and giving away their personal data just uh, without any uh, like thinking <laughs> without uh, any concerns that it can be somehow used against them so yeah so our main purpose was that this feeling of losing control over this situation uh, how can be uh, how can be how can be this con control regained and uh, of course the, this first mission of this exhibition is just to give uh, instruments and uh, raise awareness about this this losing of control situation <laughs> and of course uh, I think especially uh, among young people who are 
being raised uh, within this digital world. Yeah, so they they are raised um, with this having uh, having their childhood uh, just begin with social media and social networks and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and so on, uh, how they can be um, prepared to this um, dangers and uh, how they can be prepared to, to live with this the whole life. Um, and of course, uh, that was our mission, that was our primary task uh, to, to raise this awareness, to show like which dangers can await us uh, during this this work <laughs> and uh, of course to give like a real instrument how this uh, can be prevent prevented. Uh, so as I said, uh, the main purpose and the main slogan of the whole exhibition is to regain control and it's also divided into three um, themes. So the first is the personal data. Uh, this blog is more about, uh, as I said, raising awareness. How can uh, personal data be used for political purposes, for advertisement purposes? Who are getting money from uh, from us, just giving away <laughs> uh, freely uh, our personal data? Uh, the second uh, topic, the second block, uh, is about cybersecurity. How, uh, which cyber, cyber, what cybersecurity means? How, how can we uh, prevent, um, like? Um, from someone to spy on us on the internet and why actually cybersecurity is such a, a big topic in 2020. And the last block um, uh, is more about um, data detox, how we can control our usage of social media and how we can um, uh, control this um, this daily usage, yeah, because uh, obviously uh, with the raising uh, tempo, we have this problem uh, that people are just uh, like hanging on on social media. And also our purpose was just to give the instruments and to raise awareness how we can control over, over this. Uh, so yeah, I think it's also like it, all these three uh, topics, all these three uh, big blocks uh, were implemented in a physical uh, dimension, and I think uh, about physical dimension, will Kirill, uh, Kirill will uh, talk more about than that. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can pick up from that. Actually, we, uh, we were very lucky that uh, we didn't start from scratch. We had great partners and uh, Luisa from Tactical Tech is today with us and uh, they've created uh, together a very great concept that is called Glassroom, which we've built on. So we had already this foundation that we can we could look up to the exhibitions all over the world uh, and kind of uh, proceed with this idea that uh, something can be in the open white space like uh, Apple store or some store that you walk in but instead of uh, uh, some gadgets you can uh, be surrounded by a lot of artifacts a lot of games and the main idea was as Dasha said not to scare people that okay you're being spied on and so on because uh, uh, I guess fear is not a very productive emotion you don't uh, you, you can't uh, make uh, conclusions from fear but rather to inspire them to show maybe some tricks that are played uh, on social media on all those people so they're not like running from this because we can we are living in the digital sphere we are uh, as Dasha said already the kids that are born now they're called digital natives because they're born <laughs> with a smartphone in their hand we cannot run away from this but we can regain control we can control our digital life smarter uh, and uh, I think it's very symbolic that we're sitting with Vitali uh, on the background of one of the art pieces that's called Art uh, Us and Them from Mike Taika. He's an engineer from Google and also an artist. And he's suggesting for two people to sit uh, from the, all those receipts that are being printed. This is AI generated fake content for elections. And he is suggesting for people to sit and have a conversation in all this spam, bot, troll generated content. So now, now we are making just 
uh, that. Uh, maybe to uh, put it in the nutshell, uh, I would also say a couple of words about the design and the idea that um, just popped up uh, in our heads once again, uh, built up on the glass room, that it would be nice to have this one button that we can push like control button on our, um, on our computer screen uh, that we can push and regain control by this one button. But that's not the case. Actually, it's impossible to do. Uh, it's a lot of efforts that we need to put in order to regain control. It starts with a man in the mirror. Once again, this is one of the main themes of what we are showing around in this exhibition that you have to work every day, uh, discern all those tricks and on social media and so on to, to be in control of your digital life. Uh, the last thing I'm, I'm going to say in this introductory remarks, not to be too long and boring, uh, is about the design. It's the bubble uh, together with the Glyp Kaporikov and Katalina Mayevska, our great Ukrainian designers, we created this visual uh, symbol of the uh, exhibition, which is a bubble that takes different shapes. Uh, and we are suggesting that we are amorphous. Our control over our digital life is amorphous. But if we pay attention, if we know all those tricks, if we are uh, wise enough, uh, we can regain it. We can, from this amorphous shape, become some concrete shape. That's what we are trying to do with the exhibition. Luis? Uh, yeah, and just yeah. maybe to, uh, to add on, um, I think uh, lots of uh, control over the, the this social, uh, social networks and misinformation, how to spread and personal data protection and so on, it's now, even now, it's uh, rather an amorphous uh, state because also GDPR, uh, the, the, the biggest step forward to data protection, on, online data protection, uh, it's also quite uh, the main critique of it. It's just like it's still uh, a bit amorphous and it cannot be, it's not clear how it can be complied with and how it will be uh, introduced in every sphere of. Um, our lives because social media it's like every sphere of um, our life now uh, so i think it's it, this metaphor has two, like two levels and the first of course is just to stop being amorphous just take control of it and become some some, some kind of shape <laughs> okay thank you Luis. the next question uh, is for you uh, i will suggest uh, and to ask you to, to tell us about the project, uh, the Glassroom is Information Edition in general, uh, and maybe about the most important artifacts of the, this edition. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be speaking on um, in this panel, and I'm happy as well that this, this is an exhibition that people can visit both online and in person. So first, I just wanted to introduce Tactical Tech. Um, Tactical Tech is an international NGO. We were founded in 2003 and we're based in Berlin, Germany. Um, Tactical Tech's work engages like both citizen and civil society organizations to explore and mitigate the impact of technology on society. This, I, I usually like to just simplify it and say that a lot of the work we do at Tactical Tech serves to demystify tech. Um, I quickly wanted to, to talk a little bit about the history of the Glassroom. Uh, the Glassroom was actually first um, held in, in 2016 at a great space called um, Haus der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin. And it was part of an exhibition called Nervous Systems. Um, back then it was called White Room. Uh, you know, just like Kirill introduced in the beginning, the Glassroom in this edition was meant to look like a kind of tech store and all of the different objects in this tech store were meant to tell different stories in a non-threatening and self-learning way and that's sort of been at the core of what we like to do at the classroom is to is to let people discover for themselves a lot of these different questions and make up their own minds um classroom then partnered up with mozilla and exhibitions uh, traveled to London, New York, and San Francisco. Um, but there was a great need for this information to leave these, these, these parts and these big cities in the world and to be able to be more accessible 
Um, and so what happened was uh, after a lot of people started writing us and finding a huge need for this content, uh, we then created what we called the Glassroom Community Edition. The Glassroom Community Edition is a lightweight, scalable, accessible, and most importantly, um, you're able to contextualize it. Because you know what, what, what happens in one country isn't necessarily going to be relevant for another country. Um, and the Glassroom Community Editions are a series of pop-up exhibitions, which can be hosted in different places. And they're often shipped in a box or even printed on location. Um, our first edition of the Community Edition was called the Internet of Things Edition. And this year we launched the Glassroom Misinformation Edition. Um, the Glassroom Misinformation Edition, it's, yeah, we have it online at, the, at present in 10 different languages. Um, as part of this collaboration, uh, the Glassroom Misinformation Edition will be in Ukrainian, it's already there, it's online as well, Russian and Armenian. Um, and you can also visit and see it in English. Uh, yeah, around March, uh, when we started noticing here in Germany a lot of different, you know, a lot of different libraries, museums, festivals closing down because of COVID-19, we really had to, you know, get together and think about how we'd be able to host these events uh, in a way that was safe and possible during COVID. So one of the things that we did was we created an online exhibition and this is the first time ever that we've done something like this and we've made all of the content accessible. Um, the content, everyone can visit it for themselves. Uh, whoever's, at, whoever's in, in Ukraine should definitely go and check out this exhibition in Kyiv. Um, but if you can't get to a physical location, um, you can visit online as well. And you'll see that it's a series of posters, five different posters and four different apps. And these apps, they're, some of them are more like games and other apps are more informative. Uh, I wanted to maybe outline a few of the main themes of the Glassroom Misinformation Edition, similarly to how uh, Daria talked about the Data Control Center. So one of the main core themes is uh, deep fakes, uh, also cheap fakes. Um, we have a few different posters on this topic. We have Deep Future, for example, and then we also have um, an app called Deep Fake Lab, which is really, uh, you know, just to go back to the question that was posed, um, what are some of the really important objects? I really, really like Deep Fake Lab. I think it's an amazing, well-made app that really kind of goes through step by step how a deep fake is produced. And not only deep fakes, but also what we call cheap fakes, which are produced with, you know, just it's very it's very easy to produce. It's very easy to put these things online, and they are a huge source of disinformation and misinformation at the moment. Um, and this app was created in partnership with design students from Density Design in Milan. Um, another one of the core themes that we have is misinformation. And I think it's important, you know, we realize that this term misinformation, it doesn't exist in so many languages. In all of the languages we've translated to, we didn't actually see this come across in any language. It always comes across as disinformation or fake news. Um, disinformation is something different, different because it's, um, you know, it's, it's false information that's spread with the intention to do harm, whereas Misinformation is, it's false information that's spread without the intention to do harm. So someone can post, um, you know, wrong information or something that's not true online, and you can look at that and repost it without, you know, the intention to do any bad. Um, but what ends, what ends up happening is you're feeling this um, misinfodemic. Um, and so, yeah, I just thought it was important to to quickly distinguish these terms and maybe call for the need for this specific term that doesn't talk about intentionality to be spoken more about. Because, you know, not all of us are going to be putting out disinformation into the world, but all of us might be susceptible to spreading misinformation 
you know, a good example of this is these um, health misinformation uh, posts. Like, so you receive a, a post saying that, you know, garlic tea can help cure COVID or help keep you immune. And so out of wanting to protect or wanting to maybe help, you can, you can forward that. And without actually a negative intention, but rather a quite a good intention. Um, and part of this theme, we have, um, we have an app called Double Checks, and we have a game called Fake or Real, which are both really fun, and I really recommend um, that, they're, that they're checked out. And then finally, we have a third um, app, which I'd like to talk about a little bit more in detail, and this is called A Drop in the Ocean. So a drop in the ocean was um, created and developed by my colleague at Tactical Tech, Varun, who leads the data and politics team. Um, a drop in the ocean is based on the ocean psychometric test. Ocean stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And these kinds of um, tests are used to psychologically profile people based on these traits and characteristics. Uh, tests like this were used by Cambridge Analytica, um, which collected uh, millions, uh, collected data on millions of people and profiled them and later used them in political campaigning. So I really recommend um, playing this game and seeing what kinds of uh, different ads you would be fed based on um, these main psychological traits. And finally, um, our third core theme was habit forming behaviors. So we asked, how do websites, computers, our phones, how are they actually designed to keep us hooked? And so we have two posters, Hooked and Are You Hooked? They're these um, eye visualizations. Uh, and we have a third poster called How Your Phone is Designed to Grab Your Attention. I really recommend um, ch checking this out. It's looking at different persuasive design tricks, which are sometimes called dark patterns. Um, and then you can understand that, you know, there's things that have been designed to make you less likely to, um, yeah, to, to put down your phone or to be able to take control of that part of your life. Uh, yeah, so I hope it's been a, a, a good introduction. I don't want to take too much of the time. Very much, Louise. Uh, maybe now I will ask uh, again uh, Daria and Kirillo about uh, the contribution of the Ukrainian artists and researchers, and maybe you can tell us uh, more about what was the research, maybe uh, stage uh, of the project in Ukraine. What's the speci Ukrainian specific uh, within the project? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have a couple of uh, artworks that uh, come from Ukrainian artists uh, because here in uh, in Data Control Center, both online and offline exhibition, we have it consists of uh, posters, uh, as Louisa said. It consists of games that uh, uh, people can play uh, coming here or being at home. Uh, but there are also some artifacts, some art uh, pieces. Uh, modern art pieces that uh, we solicited from all over the world, uh, but also from Ukrainian artists. So uh, I would like to say uh, that there is a one art piece from Ukrainian group called uh, Sviter Group. Uh, it's, uh, it consists of Lera Polenskova and Max uh, Robotov, uh, and they uh, made the artwork that's called Tiny Beakers, Tiny, Tiny Breakers. It's about uh, different screens that are physically damaged. Uh, and um, they, they're supposed to show, to translate the same message, but because they're physically damaged, uh, you can see different things on each of the screens. And therefore, uh, Lera and Max, uh, they are trying to tell us that the sender sends us the same message, but we receive it differently because of other uh, disturbances and noise on the internet. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, games that uh, our Ukrainian teams collaborated on. One of them is uh, in the cooperation with Sensorama Lab that create uh, um, augmented reality design and virtual reality design. So uh, this mask, you, uh, in this mask you can choose the amount of subscribers that you have. 
and you can see them in the physical space. We wanted to do it because a lot of the things that are shared on social media are shared because the amount of our friends, of our followers is intangible. But if we see them in the same room, we understand that that's a lot of people and maybe we should re rethink our habits of sharing some personal data. One more uh, cooperation that I'm really proud uh, about is uh, Reface. It's a uh, uh, Ukrainian team, an app uh, that works with synthetic media. Uh, Luisa mentioned um, deepfakes. Deepfakes is one of the real realization of, uh, it's a bad uh, usage, I guess, of the synthetic media. It's when, uh, I guess, bad people use this technology, but this technology can also be used in good purposes. And uh, we created an app a game that uh, where uh, visitors can choose whether this video was generated or not. And we tell them what is synthetic me media, how can they be used and how they can be spotted uh, on. It's like an addition to the uh, app uh, Deepfake Lab that uh, our partners Tactical Tech have created. Uh, we, we cooperated also with a lot of uh, Ukrainian teams that work with uh, uh, media literacy. For instance, uh, IREX Ukraine, they created a special kit which also was a build up for the data detox kit that uh, Tactical Tech created. We, we've created the fact check and relaxation kit. So um, a PDF file, you can download it on our platform or you can come here and download it in the uh, our physical exhibition, where day by day you have small advice, small practices, how you can be more media literate. Uh, there is also collaboration with Cifralaba, a team. Uh, they uh, made a game, a special game on protecting, on choosing a good password because um, we, we don't know. We, we sometimes are very lazy and we choose like one, two, three, four, five passwords or like our date of birth passwords. But what are actually good passwords? Do, do you know about that? And uh, our partners, Cifralaba, they created this game where you can decipher, you can open uh, uh, phones of other people, so to say, and meanwhile learn how to create a really reliable good password. Uh, there's also uh, a 3D uh, artwork of Stepan Rabchenko, one more Ukrainian contemporary artist that tries to visualize computer viruses. Because uh, now uh, uh, we hear a lot about COVID and scientists from all over the world uh, with microscopes, they were able to decipher to see the COVID virus, but how can we see the computer viruses without art? Of course, we, need, uh, we needed some artists to visualize them and uh, Stepan Rabchenko did that. So it's just uh, to, to name a few, because uh, together with Tactical Tech Artifacts, we have over 30 of them, so I could talk uh, about <laughs> them like forever. Uh, but just to say uh, about different very talented teams that are not only artists, but also are um, people who work with the topics that the, the exhibition is dedicated uh, to. Uh, they definitely were uh, eager to collaborate with us. And maybe one more that I am very proud to mention is the ISD group that won a Khan Lion, a very uh, prestigious award. Uh, it's a Ukrainian team. They made uh, two AIs and one learned from news from Russia, one channel and another from Deutsch. Maybe you've heard about this case. It's rather famous. And uh, they were eager to collaborate with us to create this game where you can discern which AI uh, said what uh, in the conversation. Very also interesting game that tells us something about misinformation, propaganda and the um, language of hatred that is all often used on different media channels. So overall different experiences, different teams collaborated and we're very happy about the lineup and about uh, when we reached out even to all those teams they were so happy to collaborate and create it with us, which was really a great experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a very important topic now, and I think it's also like important to tell their stories and to show their results, because in, especially in Ukraine, uh, there are so many uh, teams that are working on the edge of technologies, and for example, the Reface yeah, team, they are created like this app, which is now like one more, uh, uh, number one in all of the chats and so on. Uh, but what I wanted also to mention, just uh, adding to your career, uh, is that we also uh, cooperated with a fact checker community, Ukrainian community, from <clears throat> Potobik Novin, 
And um, this also was very important to us, like to show this aspect of political manipulations and uh, how it, how you can spot them and how you can like understand what's going on and how to uh, distinguish between the fake news and um, and, and uh, true information. So Alona Romaniuk uh, created for us like two exponents to she's a famous uh, fact checker and. Um, also, uh, I think uh, it's, it's also important to mention that we wanted also to highlight not only like a general problems that any person uh, could experience, uh, but also like typical, typical Ukrainian problems. For example, we have like two exponents. Um, uh, the one is do not call bot. I think uh, in Ukraine, especially where we have like uh, quite a weak uh, legal regulation of the sphere, uh, like databases uh, with your telephone number and uh, your email can be given away um, to some kind of um, <clears throat> really bad <laughs> uh, digital agencies that then will be sending you like uh, ad emails or like you will be receiving calls with advertisements and so on. So and we created a, a bot, a telegram, like it's a bot that built in in a website of the uh, online exhibition, uh, and you can have like consultation with a bot uh, if you are receiving such kind of calls or receiving such kind of emails. Uh, how can you unsubscribe or block them? Uh, because uh, actually, uh, I was also surprised like <laughs> while <clears throat> working on this um, on this exponent that actually there is no like a final legal way how you can do it. So you can of course like uh, regulate it, but it's not like a clear question uh, which can be like. Uh, sold like within five minutes. So there's also like a, a communal action is also needed, for example, for that. And uh, the second exponent, just like to mention it briefly, um, I, th I think it's a, quite a personal story uh, for me. Um, it's all about like this dating agencies, uh, which um, not like agencies, but like yeah, like dating websites, not like Tinder or something like that, but uh, websites where you have like um, uh, different uh, profiles of Ukrainian wives and uh, foreign uh, foreign men can uh, should pay like money for each minute that he uh, brings chatting with uh, brings about chatting with this uh, with these girls and very often there are like lots of stories on the internet. Um, and also in the media, uh, where uh, the workers of such uh, of such agencies are usually also not not only like girls, young girls who are um, like chatting with and leading like multiple accounts <laughs> with fake photos on it, but also a man who are just like um, managing uh, an account of a beautiful like blonde woman of, of the age of 30 I don't know it's I found this really interesting um, stories and uh, we also have like this exponent uh, specifically highlight highlights uh, this uh, this topic and um, highlights the stories of uh, of such girls like re and you should you should decide who stands behind the account if it's a real girl it's not. Yeah. Uh, well, I am totally agree with you uh, that in Ukraine we have this uh, problem and we don't have a really a good uh, regulation in this issue. I mean, personal data and, uh, uh, for example, EU have this GDPR, GDPR regulation and uh, it was introduced uh, maybe uh, a year and a half uh, ago. Uh, but in Ukraine we have a problem of, uh, for example, of really uh, dangerous leaks of uh, personal information of journalists, for example, uh, and uh, we don't really have a strong reaction from the government or from the uh, government agencies uh, towards this. It was uh, like uh, a huge problem for Ukraine, as for me, I, I, I can say this as a journalist, for example. Yeah, uh, I would like to address the next question uh, to Serhii. Uh, Sergey, uh, a year before uh, the key of uh, by now uh, black cloud also addressed the is issues of disinformation and fakes. 
In addition, uh, uh, Black Cloud was the host of the Glassroom exhibition also, of, uh, as I understand, of another, it was another edition of uh, exhibition Glassroom. Can you tell us about the uh, concept and the specificity of the Black Cloud in the context of uh, disinformation and fakes? Please tell us more about this. I thank you for inviting me for this conversation and uh, thanks again to the Tactical Tech who kindly uh, let us to exhibit the Glassroom Community Edition, uh, another edition which Luis talked about it briefly. Uh, so it was the Black Cloud Biennial, Kiev Biennial, uh, which uh, happened last year in the Polytechnical Library, in the Library of Polytechnical University, uh, a big technical hub of Ukraine. Um, and it dealt with a uh, number of issues uh, mixed uh, Black Cloud functions as a plane of intersection of global cloud of digital data, radioactive bloom of Chernobyl, environmental crisis, and the political cloud shaped by the illusion of transparency of the post ideological state. Uh, it worked as a mixture of those topics. It was a volatile cloud of invisible to of invisible factors that molds our perception. The exhibition outlined uh, emergency state in environmental, technological, and informational dimensions of the end of the last century and uh, projected its perspective to the post-human condition, to the transcendence of classical human and the prosthetic enhancement of the imperfection of Homo sapiens. So uh, for us, it was important to show uh, how technological um, and data issues are uh, uh, brought into being in collateral, uh, collateral damaging also human beings uh, with uh, how it deals with environmental problems also, uh, how the uh, production of technological devices uh, are uh, connected to the extractivism and to the exploitation of the planet, uh, also damaging the health of people and so on. So uh, uh, the classroom was one of uh, one of the 13 projects involved in this exhibition uh, but i would say it was really an anchor one it was like uh, really important for us to have it to make the introduction for the viewer uh, on the privacy issues and to enter this digital realm of uh, untransparency and the cloud of uh, different threats um, what can I add with Ali to this? Well, as, uh, maybe how long was uh, the exhibition, uh, the Black Cloud, open for the audience? It was about two months. Uh, two months. Last autumn. And do you think that for, uh, the Ukrainian audience really um, resonate uh, with these uh, topics? I mean, uh, yeah, disinformation is uh, really like a popular topic here because of uh, Russian aggression and because of uh, all these media uh, issues. But uh, it seems to me that in Ukraine we don't really have uh, talk a lot about uh, all this digital environment in, s in the sense of uh, problem problematizing of all uh, online platforms, commercial platforms, uh, because it seems to me that we know what is disinformation very well, but not so much uh, our society is deep in this uh, digital uh, criticism. Uh, we don't talk uh, a lot about this. And then I have a question for all uh, Ukrainian uh, participants. 
of our discussion about uh, this issue. Do you think we need more um, projects or more critique towards uh, the g digital environment? I mean, uh, digital infrastructures, digital devices uh, as a whole. Kirillov, maybe? Oh. Or Sergey? I can start with it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because I have a part of an answer for that. Uh, in the last year, so we, apart from the exhibition, we had a theoretical program, uh, program and uh, <clears throat> part of it was uh, a symposium uh, created by Svetlana Matvienka, Canadian Ukrainian researcher, uh, called the Communicative Militarism, where uh, such uh, quite a famous people we met there as Geert Loving and uh, Nils Stanula, for example. So, and uh, there we tried to uh, go deeper into the problem of security and uh, 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 the whole symposium kind of tried to um, pose the question if we can call the present condition of affairs a war, a cyber war, uh, because like the data collected from the user there, uh, one of its purpose is a military purpose, well, it's, uh, it could be a soft power or like real power involved in uh, so or digital revolutions, velvet revolutions and the US elections, for example. Uh, so I, I think it should be a question of post on daily basis to uh, for independent organizations, NGOs to track those digital uh, digital steps, digital routes of uh, fraud and misinformation and things like that. Karila, uh, Daria, maybe you want to add something about? Mm, I just. I want to confirm what was said and uh, to mention that uh, the cyberspace is another better field right now, maybe even more uh, important uh, than, than other spheres. We've seen it uh, on the example of uh, elections, for instance, 2016 in the United States. So we've seen it by uh, huge uh, infrastructures uh, that were uh, disabled by viruses, such viruses as virus beta or wanna cry viruses, uh, that a lot of damage can be done without, fro by hackers or by computer scientists not leaving their living rooms, uh, which is re really scary. And uh, once again, coming back to the main uh, topic of our uh, exhibition, Regain Control, uh, we are saying, for instance, in, uh, on the cyber uh, issue, we're saying that uh, you can build on very secure systems, but if you are able to trick person, the, each, each of us is the most weak, um, the most weak uh, thing in this chain of security. So you can build whatever you want, but if the person is tricked by this email saying you win a lottery, just click here and uh, put all your data there. So nothing will help. And therefore this awareness that uh, actually this project is aimed to achieve and so many other projects uh, are being made to achieve uh, very important for us to be literate, for us to be aware of this and for us to be cautious. It's also very important to know that not only like cyber security, um, it's like about uh, the defense of infrastructure, like, like some kind of cyber uh, space. But for example, if we are talking about a misinformation, it's also like a battle for like people's minds. I mean, if you are living in a country which is divided uh, ideologically so great that uh, you can basically be like, <laughs> I don't know, living in a country which is not uh, feeling like one country, but like one nation, then of course it's like, um, it's another factor of influence. It's also can be people are not cannot be agreed on any issue it's also quite a problem and um beside of what's going on now in ukraine 
Uh, I think the most uh, stirring example is to what happened in USA. Yeah, so you have basically like 50% of people who are um, of one mindset and are deeply concerned about uh, that. And you have 50% of people who have completely different mindset and they are believing in other things and uh, for and social media, they just like um, they're trying to prevent this div this division, but uh, I think, in terms of uh, psychology, it's uh, it's very powerful tool. How can you to make how can make you this division is much more deeper, and um, I think the part the part of this of our exhibition is also like to give like instruments uh, how not to be affected and how to spot this misinformation and how you can uh, and and how can you combat it yeah how can you explain and how can you spot it and not not be tricked by such kind of tools thank you uh, yeah. maybe the next issue which uh, we can discuss uh, for me it uh, looks like all this uh, digital gadgets and all these digital platforms, online plat platforms and the digital environment, uh, it looks like there is some problem in design of this um, infrastructure and uh, gadgets. Uh, I mean, they produce so much uh, data, so much uh, uh, personal data, uh, and it really looks like, and your uh, exhibition is also, uh, for me, it's a part of this, uh, uh, you should just you just try to show that how much information we uh, everybody of every user every person every citizen uh, generates so maybe uh, the problem in design of our gadgets design of uh, platforms we generate uh, too much uh, data maybe um, we can solve this uh, from the material side of the things. I mean, if our mobile phones or our computers generate so many data, is it possible to change this? Not in the technical way. I am sure that technically it's possible, but I mean, uh, like idea. What do you think about this idea, Kirillo? Um, I think that it's very hard uh, to implement that. Uh, first of all, let's uh, explain. I, I think it's may maybe uh, very, um, obvious uh, but um, we, we are have we have to pay somehow for services and uh, while we're not paying with money we are paying with our personal data it is often said that we are the product that Facebook sells because it's a free instrument that we use so they sell our data to the companies or a rather access to us for other companies so that they can target us with ads uh, of course, you can uh, disable it, for instance, somehow for for a tiny extent in like YouTube uh, while paying uh, for the service. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg also said that they are thinking about this paid subscription to Facebook. Maybe it will also uh, be implemented, but uh, otherwise uh, they still can have this access. We are giving it for free. We are giving it uh, willingly. Uh, we have actually one of the artifacts here. Uh, it's uh, Kostya Pochtar. He is a Ukrainian uh, musician who, who we asked to read the user agreement of Ukrainian Facebook. It's 84 uh, pages. He uh, dedicated over six hours to read it all. Of course, when we agree for this user agreements, we don't read for six hours user agreements. We just blindly agree to something. Uh, but uh, can it be? Um, can we avoid it? Uh, I think to um, to some extent, yes. And we already see it uh, to some extent uh, due to GDPR that was mentioned a couple of times today. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, a great uh, initiative in European Union. You have the right for oblivion. You, you can be forgotten, so to say, at least on the territory of uh, uh, European Union. And you can ask um, and 
win the SUE if you want to be forgotten from the web. Of course, you won't be if you uh, go out to United States, for instance, you will be able to find yourself on Google there, even if you are, so to say, forgotten on uh, GDPR. But at least it's the first step. At least it makes all those companies, especially the ones that operate also in European Union, uh, to, sh to at least tell you that they are collecting cookies, they're collecting information to give you the tools to at least try to um, avoid it uh, as, as much as you can. And I guess it's very great uh, initiative that can set an example for all, all over the world because, of course, uh, such companies, they're afraid of uh, uh, too much uh, of the regulation from the government side. And I guess the too, uh, too much is also too bad uh, because then it turns uh, the democracies into uh, autocracies or some uh, very totalitarian re regimes that control this freedom of speech and so on. So um, I guess Yes, it's a very difficult situation and we have to invite a lot of uh, different scholars from different fields in order to um, somehow create the best solution. I don't think there is a perfect solution. There is not such solution, I'm afraid. But we can at least try to have this uh, discussion from uh, people who work in tech industry, people from governments all over the world, people from, I don't know, philosophical even uh, benches that can somehow find this balance of government regulating tech companies, not so much intruding, but also not for governments to have this access over personal data because it's also very dangerous. So um, once again, this is a huge issue to be solved uh, and a lot of parties have to be involved. Maybe Louise, Louis, please. Yeah, I do. Um, well, I think I agree with everything Kirill's saying um, and I actually want to take it back to a way maybe simpler um, solution that, that could be in the palm of our hands. Um, and this is then going back to the data detox kit, um, which often, you know, the, the DDK, it offers these simple, um, simple uh, solutions, simple um, tricks that you can sort of, um, you can do to just be a little bit more aware. And I wanted to bring um, our attention maybe to the things that we could do at home um, and that we could do ourselves and to just make us a little bit more conscious about uh, our, our phone usage and how much freely we give up data. Because even though we, we can, of course, criticize the bigger systemic issues and the need for legislation, we can also say that, you know, a, a lot of us can, can give up data so um, freely. So sometimes it's it's just a matter of maybe going on to your, your Google settings, if it's Google products you use, or Facebook settings, if it's social media that you want to be more aware of, and turn off um, the notifications and turn off the, the trackers. Um, this is like a simple way to do it. Uh, there's an article that, the, that we published on the Data Detox Kit site called Smartphones Call for Smart Habits. And I think sometimes just being aware of like that we might be stuck in a loop and being aware might begin with us saying, why do I feel the urge every 30 seconds to refresh my phone? You know, or why do I, why do I, if I forget my phone at home, why do I feel like a part of me is missing? And so, you know, there's, there's different exercises that we can do to just become more present about our, our own relationships with our phones. And um, this can be anything from, for example, uh, on, my, on, on my smartphone, I, um, I have this, the screen time function. And on the screen time function, I basically like limited my usage of certain apps. So especially social media, I don't want to allow myself to be on them so much. So I've made this like, this time limit of 20 minutes. And when I'm approaching 20 minutes, my phone will let me know that I've already been on my on that app for that long. And so it's just exercises to make myself more aware. Um, you can also leave yourself physical reminders. So for example, if you don't like checking your phone first thing as soon as you wake up in the morning, maybe you can charge it away from your bed. You know, you can leave yourself uh, notes and just ask the same way, you know, all of this is very similar to, to habit forming behaviors. So I like to think about 
um, my relationship to my phone the same way that I, I look at any habits. So if, if my intention is to drink more water and to hydrate more, I'm probably going to keep a glass of water next to me all the time. If my intention is to be a little bit more mindful of how much of my personal data I'm sharing, this also starts with, um, you know, looking at these, these apps and, and finding ways to tone it down. Um, or just, you know, completely turning off notifications. If you know that um, the vibration noise and the, the, the different noises your phone's making is going to tempt you, maybe just turn, turn them off. Mm -hmm. Just to add on what uh, Luis just said. So just to sum up maybe that everything is, on, is in our hands. So we can just like control it like on a micro level, but of course, if we are talking about like macro level in, in terms of state and so on, then of course, it's just another another uh, level of controlling and so on. And I don't think that in like uh, next few years, we can uh, set up like a global framework a framework or legal framework that will protect us. But of course, the first step is always to begin with yourself, to begin uh, just to look uh, at this problem and just acknowledge that it exists, that it's not normal that some people just spend six hours on Instagram uh, during the day. And it's always like, you you just can cannot see it like straight away. You, you need to see statistics. You just need to, uh, to know and to look where to look up and uh, what to search for, and of course to know how how to um, how to combat it. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to share one analogy that goes really well with what what Dasha's saying, and this is like if we want to think about our data as our house. So if I asked if I asked everyone here right now, where is your phone and where are your house keys right now? You can probably tell me where where that is because they're they're the kind of keys to opening your house. But if you look at your digital life as a house, um, we often don't do that, but we should because there's just just as much personal and valuable information um, mm -hmm. in the data sphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe yeah, what uh, I wanted to add is uh, I'm I'm very grateful that Luisa added uh, this personal layer, yeah, because that's uh, what our exhibition is actually about. I was just maybe uh, saying that uh, it, it's, it's crucial to control uh, everything what is in our hands, like notification, which is, uh, you, I recommend to everyone because I turned them off, all of them myself, and just felt so much relief. Uh, and uh, to also find those settings on Facebook. Actually, we have one of the artifacts, a video that tells you where you can press all those buttons and uh, control your settings so Facebook does and uh, take your notific uh, your geolocation and uh, so and other things, uh, but what I was trying to say is that, uh, of course, we need to talk more uh, and also have that. Uh, tech companies accountable because, as you know, uh, after the scandal uh, that was connected uh, to Cambridge Analytica, uh, Facebook gave more tools. Of course, they were scared to lose their reputation, to lose their users, and they gave more tools for privacy and so on. So we don't need to let it go as well, uh, but because we don't have the full control. And I think these two things should be simultaneous. So we need to do what is in our hands, of course. It's number one. Uh, and control our digital life, but also see it in the perspective of uh, society as well. And maybe have those companies accountable and uh, push more uh, towards the, um, you know, keeping our data to ourselves. Uh, and maybe educating more about the uh, value of personal data because many people, actually many people whom I talk to and many people uh, who first come to our exhibition, they say, okay, I'm not the celebrity, I'm not the a politician, I'm not famous, okay, why do I care uh, that my data would be breached, that I would give out my data? I don't have anything to hide. But actually, uh, one of our uh, writers, one of our collaborators, Vadim Gudima, he gave a very great analogy in our personal talk he says he said that nobody likes most of people close the doors to toilet uh, when they're using it of course and the same thing with privacy uh, maybe you are not a celebrity but you 
you need it, you need your privacy, it's about yourself, something that makes us unique, that you want to keep to yourself, and therefore, once again, reminding uh, that your data belongs to you, and you are up to decide what you do with it, and you are, have the right to know what is done with it. Uh, that should be told, uh, talked more about, educated more about, lobbied more about, but once again, thanks, Louisa, for uh, reminding us that it's also in our hands to, to, to some extent, to do everything we can to control our digital lives. Okay, uh, I encourage you to make questions to each other. Do you have some? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm. Uh, may, maybe I have this, uh, the question about, we t we're talking about um, our, uh, our uh, curate, curation of different exhibitions, but um, I wanted to know more uh, and ask the curators how your life may be changed after you uh, hosted this first exhibition. Did you change your habits or did you change your attitudes uh, after you've uh, assembled all of that? And maybe, yeah, maybe to Liz and to uh, Sergi, right? Uh, yeah, I, would, I would want to learn more f f about their habits. Did they change after you've assembled all that you have done? Who wants to comment first, maybe? Um, Sergi, do you want to go first? I can. Nothing really changed after that. <laughs> 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 oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can go in some details. Why? Mm. Mm. It is like connected, of course, with uh, the bringing up the whole topic of black cloud. So it, it somehow was initiated by personal awareness, of course, of the uh current state of things in uh in environment and also in the digital environment so um, i tried before that project i also tried to to somehow make like digital fitness well maybe not so always probably but um, i wouldn't say something dramatically changed um, but yeah, sorry. I have a question then. Okay. After you. Yeah, maybe Lisa can ask if she changed her habits. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I would say that um, I did change many habits. I think, you know, just some of the easiest habits for me to change were turning off. Um, turning off certain things and turning on certain things. This is specific to my phone and my computer, but actually just going through this process of looking at my machines as stupid machines, you know, cause we often, I often um, before maybe saw a lot of the machines surrounding me, whether it was my computer or my phone as quite complex, intelligent, emotional almost. And I think for me, I'm, I'm still going through a process maybe of starting to question how I use these different machines. Um, that's one thing that I'd say really changed. Um, and another thing that was, you know, for me very, very difficult and still is, is to address um, misinformation and disinformation spreading. It's very hard actually, when you're seeing um, false information spreading, it's actually really hard to to stop it and question um, and have these conversations with people. I often find that people get very offensive or hurt. Um, and so if anything, I've been trying to finesse a little bit my way of, of talking to loved ones, especially about um, the kind of information that's spreading. Um, I come from Brazil and in Brazil, um, WhatsApp is very, very popular. WhatsApp is pretty much the internet and it's very easy to, to forward things um, to each other on there. So I've been, been trying as much as I can just to uh, find nice ways to talk about some of the information I see. And uh, you and, and Daria, I would be interested too. 
what changed? Um, just uh, before answering what changed, uh, it's very interesting that um, that you try to combat that on a personal level because I I I think that on a personal level it's even the hardest <laughs> the hardest way just to convince your just to convince your family or your friends like new friends that um, what they believe in it's false or or it, it, um, somehow mislead it yeah because it's always emotional it's always cats on person. Um, and so on. So I, I, I'm fail, failing somehow in this in this way because I don't have sometimes the courage like to, like to to push forward to the end because always it's like gets somebody's hurt or I don't know. <laughs> it's quite that is complicated. That's what I meant um, by the division in societies. Yeah. So um, you you the other side sometimes don't hear anybody except. Um, except those who are like echoing um, one's beliefs, yeah. So that is the hardest part, I think. So great job. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, alert you about one, something that a colleague of mine recently found, and maybe it's going to be good for you. And it's called the debunking handbook. Um, and this is basically talking about how you can debunk information which, which is false or talk about it. So you always lead with the fact. So lead with a very clear, simple, concrete fact, right? To, to debunk. And then you warn people about the myth related to that fact and why maybe this myth is going around. You explain why the myth is misleading and then you again go back to the fact. So it's like this circular um, method for debunking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great tool. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and anyway, about the uh, habits, um, I don't know. I still have time uh, a time problem, so I sometimes it's just like catching up myself myself like twelve o'clock in the night, and I'm just looking at memes or something like that. And <laughs> why do why why I'm doing this? I I don't know. I don't have any idea, but it's really like a problem. <laughs> and um, I think um, what. Um, what I learned personally from the uh, the whole period uh, during which we were preparing this exhibition, just like how to uh, how to cope with that, and just like yeah, it gave me some tools and and understanding that it's really like a huge problem and how can control it. Um, yeah, I know that Kirillo is all about the control of notifications, so that sometimes I cannot reach him. him so, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it's also I think it's quite an important issue. Sri, uh, do you still have a question? Mm, not really. I'm thinking now that this whole situation is some somehow reminds me of the condition of Middle Ages when you like for example as an enlightened person you have constantly to fight the myths about the witches or the witchcraft or uh, whatever circulating in, in like folk culture and also with the issue of regaining control it's also very close to regaining control over your own body when you was when it was uh, possible to buy or sell like real physical person to be a slave uh, also of, like we can call it like a metaphor of cooperative slavery or whatever uh, so it seems all the thing is uh, a, a really early stage and somehow it will go to enlightenment process uh, in nearest 10 or 20 years and uh, hope we can uh, somehow regain this control over at least our like basic features and uh, forget about the early internet like not the early internet but the current internet um, slavery uh, Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, so, Kirillo, Daria, uh, Sergei, Luis, thank you very much for this conversation. And uh, hopefully, uh, we will 
it's still possible to regain a control our, uh, over our data. I am personally believe it's maybe it's possible, but sometimes it uh, sounds like utopia. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.